Thank you, John. Uh, hope you all can hear me and see me at home. Um, hi, my name is Mitchell. Um, we're going to be talking about FreeBSD on RISC V today. Um, I am a FreeBSD source committer uh, Canadian. I live in Halifax on the East Coast. Um, so honestly, a shorter journey for me to get here than most of you. Um, but this is my first time at BSDCAN uh, in person. So um, I'm excited to be here and, and meet you all uh, face to face. Um, I spent about a little over the past five years working on FreeBSD RISC V in some capacity. Um, I kind of began hacking on it when I was uh, still uh, in university. Uh, it was like a good way to work on something that taught me a lot about different aspects of the kernel and kind of low level programming. Um, since then, I've, I'm very grateful to have been sponsored by the foundation to, to continue to work on this, and that has, um, you know, paid my rent in the past couple of years. Um, and so, you know, I'm kind of looking at this now with, with five years and, uh, of uh, kind of perspective on, on this architecture and this platform, and um, so I hope to share that with you guys today. Um, the goals for this talk, so we're going to explore kind of the, the health of this platform or, or um, you know, how does it look now and where is it going um, compared to, I did speak at the Dev Summit in 2021 that was online and we kind of did uh, more of a history. So um, this is going to be not super technical, somewhat informal. Hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. We have an hour and a half and I don't want to talk quite that long, but I do have more slides than I thought. Um, the agenda, basically, we're going to do a quick uh, overview of some RISC-V hardware that exists today. We're going to talk about the challenges of supporting this hardware from uh, an operating system uh, point of view, um, the status of ports and packages on FreeBSD and um, FreeBSD RISC-V and kind of what comes in the future. Um, so yes, we'll do a little tour of some hardware that is kind of exists now for purchase or is upcoming. Um, as John referred to it earlier, sand, which I, I particularly like. Um, High Five Unmatched, uh, this is kind of our reference platform for FreeBSD RISC V. So um, we, we fully support this hardware um, that was kind of first came out uh, a couple years ago. Um, thanks to Sci-5 for, they are essentially a RISC-V um, IP company, but they have produced, they've kind of pushed the envelope with producing hardware to stimulate the, uh, the software ecosystem. So, um, so yes, they've formed themselves to be a reference platform of sorts, and they provide uh, good documentation that has allowed uh, us to port to this platform fairly easily. Um, and I would say this board is not interesting in the sense that it just works out of the box. Um, it's not particularly performant or um, it doesn't have any exciting hardware or software features really. Um, but it is available and if you own one, if you happen to own one or you happen to buy one for $740, you could run FreeBSD on that today. Um, Vision 5 version 2 is uh, a single board computer that we're kind of in the process of uh, doing bring up and, and upstreaming of support for that. So we have, as of the last couple of months, the clock and reset drivers, the MMC SD card, and um, the, uh, the serial console are all working. We have a, we have a port for their particular flavor of U-boot. 
Um, so you can follow the instructions on the wiki to, um, oh, maybe they're not quite updated yet. But soon you'll be able to pull the, uh, the 15 snapshot and flash it to an SD card and, and at least boot on this. But there's no Ethernet yet. That's kind of the next big step. Um, documentation is decent for this board, but not quite enough. Um, there are several devices that are just not, um, they're not adequately covered by the data sheet. And so we're kind of faced with this problem of how do we, uh, how do we create drivers for these. Um, it also has an onboard G GPU, which maybe someday will be covered by upstream Linux uh, graphics drivers. Um, but I'm not really sure about that. Um, this is another board that came out a couple years ago, the All Winter D1. Um, this is another one that's kind of in progress. Um, I own one of these, and I have been playing with it. Um, there is a U-boot for it, but uh, it doesn't seem like the vendor is trying to get that into upstream U-boot. They just kind of have their fork, um, but it does work. Um, the Hi5 Premiere, I guess, uh, is kind of the next announced platform from Sci5. So um, based on the previous Sci5 hardware, we can kind of expect that FreeBSD will run on this uh, without too much effort. Um, we will see. Supposedly, it will be available soon, but I couldn't find any information on that, really. Um, you can check out the product page. I was going to upload these slides to the Dev Summit page. I forgot to do that first. I do have some links, but uh, you'll have to wait. Um, Milk 5 Pioneer, I find that to be a disgusting name. <laughs> this is an announced platform. I don't think it's quite uh, available for purchase yet. Um, so it has the uh, T-head system on a chip, or Schwantai uh, C902, C920 CPU. So um, kind of the same underlying CPU architecture as the all winter board, which we're going to talk about more. Um, yeah, essentially this comes as like a, a micro ATX form factor, and they're selling it as a whole PC, make native RISC-V development possible. Um, you know, this is a bigger machine than we've seen before, so um, supporting this might be uh, might be interesting. And it has all the kind of peripherals that you would expect um, from a PC. Uh, a few other uh, single board computers of interest um, are listed here. Um, we're going to not talk about these too much. Um, Banana Pi is one I just heard about. And it has a CPU I've never heard about. So I can't quite comment on how difficult it will be to support that. Um, but the others have the same um, T-head system on a chip uh, underneath them. Hopefully that was uh, clear enough. Um, next, we're going to talk about the kind of software side challenges of supporting a, the RISC-V um, architecture. Um, so quick recap, RISC-V has three privilege, RISC-V CPUs have three privilege levels, the machine mode uh, for firmware and bootloaders, the supervisor mode where the kernel, FreeBSD kernel runs, um, and that has uh, virtual memory features, um, and user mode for user space applications. Um, the supervisor mode where our FreeBSD kernel runs has somewhat limited capabilities. It can't uh, read you know, every system register that uh, machine mode can. Um, 
in a way that's like a little more restrictive than other CPU architectures. Um, so they've come up with this thing called the Supervisor Binary Interface, SBI, um, which is essentially a firmware runtime you can call into um, from the kernel um, and have it perform different tasks for you. So for example, um, RISC V does not have uh, a, it does not define any instruction to perform a remote um, TLB shoot down. So you have to call into the, um, you have to call into firmware to get it to do that for you, um, among other things. And they, so they have a specification for this and then OpenSBI being the kind of standard implementation of the of the interface and they keep adding new functionality to this um, sort of as a way to mitigate what is missing from the RISC-V instruction set, um, which we're gonna talk about here. So initially in uh, kind of the early and recent versions of the RISC-V uh, architecture, they did not specify any cache management instructions, um, so no, no way to, to flush or validate the data cache. They didn't uh, define any, um, any page table bits to, def to declare the um, kind of memory type or properties of the page you're talking about. So you couldn't say, um, you know, this virtual address mapping is um, for device memory or this virtual address mapping should, um, should not be cached. There was no way, to, uh, no way to specify that and there were no requirements on IO coherence with respect to the CPU. So unlike, um, I believe, x86 uh, device, device IO is always coherent with respect to the CPU data cache as part of the um, instruction set architecture. But RISC-V, they said, no, we want to keep it open. We want to allow implementations to um, essentially decide that for themselves. Um, but they didn't provide any way to deal with such a thing. Um, so the first thing resolved in a later specification. So they, they have defined a set of um, cache management instructions for RISC-V, but you won't find them in any hardware that exists yet today. And same thing with the uh, page-based memory types extension. Um, it does allow you to specify um, attributes on virtual memory translations. Um, and this is, you know, it's defined and, and you can, uh, you can, work with it in QMU, but it's not, again, it's not in real hardware, really. Um, consequences of these problems, this kind of lack of, uh, lack of specification when it comes to cache coherence. Um, for the star five, um, star five boards, um, so, as I said, we're working on upstreaming the Vision 5 version 2. The original prototype was called the Beagle 5 Starlight, um, and then they shipped that to a few FreeBSD developers, um, and then Beagle 5 is now no longer involved with that, I don't understand. Um, and then they did another prototype, uh, the Vision 5 version 1. Both of these um, had non uh, coherent device memory with respect to the CPU. So, so it essentially required a, a kind of hacky workaround method in order to um, in order to talk to device driver in order for device drivers to talk to device memory properly. Um, we had to use this workaround. Um, for this reason, bring up on these uh, platforms was a failure. Star 5 upstreamed a bit and, 
and then they kind of stopped. Um, I worked pretty hard to try and bring FreeBSD up on these, um, but because upstreaming wasn't quite complete, uh, among other reasons, like non-coherent uh, device memory being really hard to work with and debug, um, you know, it was bring up failure, and I have two new paperweights. Yes, and a few other people. Um, other consequences of this kind of uh, poorly specified, um, these poorly specified aspects of the instruction set um, for these T-head uh, system on the chips, they said, okay, well, we need page-based memory types, so we're just going to, we're just going to make it ourselves. We're going to define it ourselves, um, you know, because we are we're ready to produce chips now. But you haven't um, defined this in the in the instruction set. Um, so they did, um, and sadly, it's it's kind of in a way that that violates the specification and not in a compatible way. So um, essentially, the the kind of default behavior. Uh, normally, these high-level bits and the, these these higher bits in the in the page table entry would be set to zero, um, and ideally they would have done it so that had kind of no effect. But but they they didn't, and so it uh, it's going to require some work to support this if we want to support this spec violating hardware. Um, they also implemented an early version of the vector extension, so that's um, an extension to the to the ISA, essentially like um, SIMD on AMD 64. Um, but again, they they did so in a it wasn't quite uh, fully ratified, and so but because they were ready to produce uh, hardware, they just went ahead and did it. So it kind of um, presents another problem when it comes to an operating system asking ourselves, well, do we want to try and support this thing that is different than what the specification says? Um, based on the available hardware, so I know we went through the, the overview quick, but uh, at least three or four of those, those um, systems have these uh, T-head system on chips, so it's essentially the most accessible um, RISC-V hardware available now. Um, so to me, it seems clear that we do need to try and support this. Maybe not the vector extension, but at least we need to be able to, to boot on these. And that requires some work um, for the page-based memory tables. Um, yeah, so there's kind of foundational changes to the PMAP that are needed. Um, really early boot uh, workarounds and um, working with the bus, bus DMA subsystem. Not to mention the T, because they didn't define the uh, cache management operations early enough, T head SOCs also define their own instructions for that. So there's a lot of work to be done to support these uh, CPUs and all that's before you can really take on trying to implement device drivers for a particular um, system. So that's why we only run on really sci fi hardware so far. Um, another example of the RISC V architecture's kind of failure to define itself was in the, the performance counter space. So um, the early specification of this, they said, okay, well, there's going to be 32 hardware counters. Um, it's up to the Im implementation what events it measures, if any, um, and what the encoding is for that. And these registers are only accessible by the, uh, by the firmware privilege level. So when it comes to um, implementing like uh, HWPMC, and libpmc, uh, you know, the performance 
counting uh, facilities. Um, the CPU architecture hasn't defined it well enough that we can even do that. Um, so how they compensated for this? Well, we added an extension to the SBI so that uh, you can manage these registers and it'll kind of handle all the um, the differences between you know a particular CPU's implementation because it's implementation defined. To do this, they provide a kind of hard to use interface. They end up defining a list of event codes anyway, and um, and it has a high cost because you have to trap to firmware just to set this up every time. And it seems overly complicated compared to if this had just been um, kind of defined more thoroughly from the start, um, which I think is a, disappoint it's a disappointing reality when you are the, um, when you're trying to support RISC-V from the software side. Um, also, they've defined this, uh, I'm not even going to try to read it, this extension that it adds um, the ability for counter overflows to generate interrupts. So if you want to use PMC stat in sampling mode to you know, measure where your application is um, spending time, um, that requires these overflow interrupts uh, to essentially interrupt at a regular interval. And because this is not defined as part of the base ISA, like the, even with the, the PMU extension fully implemented, um, what you can actually do and measure on, a, on the unmatched board, for example, is not very, um, it's not very useful. Um, and why are these, why did these failures happen? The spec is written by committee, like they, the RISC-V ISA has tried to create um, this kind of open source model for a CPU architecture. Um, and so it suffers from the problems that all open, so open source uh, projects do. And they also, I think, in my opinion, kind of try to define it so broadly that RISC-V could be implemented from the tiniest uh, to the biggest CPU. And it's just hard to have things done right and completely when you want to do everything. Um, in general, sorry. Let me catch myself here. Um, in general, if you're trying to bring up FreeBSD on a new single board computer, such as uh, the, the ones I listed, like any of the upcoming ones, um, you're going to face some challenges. And, and for RISC-V, they're no different than kind of the existing embedded uh, boards we have for ARM and ARM64. So, you're at the mercy of the vendor for how much they're willing to um, push upstream. So in the best case scenario, they upstream support for their hardware to Linux. They upstream it to U-Boot, which we rely on heavily. And they'll, um, and they'll upstream it to the OpenSBI firmware as well. Um, and if they don't, like that makes it harder, if not impossible, for us to uh, support it as a hardware platform. And in the same sense, you're at the mercy of how much documentation they give you. Um, because if you, if this, uh, if this new board has you know, an Ethernet chip that we don't have a driver for, or maybe it's like a little bit newer version of the chip and we need to support that, um, but they don't provide any documentation on what it is, how it works. Um, you know, you don't have a lot of choice. You can, depending on your disposition, look at the GPL Linux drivers, but you're, um, you know, getting into a gray area there. And SOC bring up in general is painful work. Um, 
So it's a challenge when it comes to, you know, people are interested in this emerging architecture. They want to see RISC-V run on these new um, toys. And they say, oh, does, do we support this? Do we support this? And, and, you know, the answer is no for any number of these reasons. Um, okay. Um, my work, what am I working on? Um, so the PMAP improvements required to support the T-head system on a chip and CPUs, um, that's kind of something that's, it's, it's going. I'm, I'm, I've been working on that lately. I have some stuff in Fabricator that's kind of preliminary to that. Um, but I want to see, I want to get this foundational work to support these um, CPUs in because then it enables us to even kind of start to do SOC bring up um, for them. Um, the, the PMC facilities, as I kind of talked about, like the current state of affairs, it's not, I have a, a mostly complete implementation. It's not super useful for existing hardware. Um, but I would like to complete it and kind of see, uh, mainly so that when this stuff matures a little bit more in, in a few years within the spec, that it might, it'll already be there, um, or at least mostly be there. Um, and then the Vision 5 version 2 upstreaming, um, that's kind of another active project. And then the kind of immediate roadmap of things I want to take on but haven't started yet supporting EFI runtime services in the kernel. So we, we boot via uBoot, um, which has an EFI interface to boot the FreeBSD EFI loader. Um, but you need some extra stuff to use the uh, runtime services from the kernel. Um, same thing with kernel, FPU, context. Um, so I think most, I think every other architecture supports this now. This is essentially, um, you know, within defined areas, being able to use uh, floating point uh, instructions and registers within the kernel. Um, so it's not too much work to support this, and it will eventually be useful for um, in-kernel crypto drivers and GPU drivers. Also in the works, um, Ruslan has begun work on RISC-V Beehive. Um, you know, that's, there's not too much more to say than that. He's, he started, and you can ask him, but um, you know, it's going well, essentially due to the simpler hypervisor architecture compared to ARM64, and also thanks to the long, long efforts to bring ARM64 Beehive into reality, which did the majority of legwork to kind of deduplicate and um, deduplicate Beehive. Um, so this is something that uh, supporting the RISC-V architecture, we're able to do a lot is kind of piggyback off of whatever ARM64 has done um, it's probably structured in a similar way here, so we're not going to reinvent the wheel, and it makes our porting efforts um, easier, which is a win in terms of um, maintenance. Okay, I went really fast, um, so let's let's catch up. Um, any questions or clarifications so far? Yes. Do we? You mentioned GPU, IP, intellectual property. Is that from inside the RISC-V project or outside and brought to it? Outside. Can you name from where? Um, so you're talking about during the, uh, the hardware overview? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know the details of it. It's called Imagine is the, the, um, the name of that particular GPU.
Have you spoken to anybody that did the initial porting to ARM v7 and <coughs> ARM v8? Um, not really. Okay, might be worth doing that because there's a lot of deja vu to me, uh, and I'm coming from the ARM side of things. So yeah, uh, yeah, that there's. I think the you may be cutting yourself on sharp bits that people have already blunted in other areas. So like the um, the coherence problems. Or what, what were you thinking there? More the, um, the actual bring up aspects, some of the U-boot pieces, uh, some of um, some of the driver issues that you're running into and how they got around. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those pain points we definitely did back in the day. Uh, and so I think it, you may... As part, I mean, I get why you've gone down it yourself, and because you want to learn and, and whatever else that yeah. all makes sense. But to lessen the pain, um, you don't need to go through pain unnecessarily. Uh, I think other people may have experienced some of that, might have been able to help you a little bit. Yeah, um, I mean, the the folks who have done bring up on ARM within FreeBSD are are aware that you know some of these pain points kind of still do exist uh, for FreeBSD specifically, right? Where when it comes to how much is the vendor giving us, um, you know, in terms of documentation, that's not a solved problem for them either. Is kind of the parallel I'm drawing here. Um, but thank you. If nothing else, then we'll keep going. Ports and packages. Um, so native package building, not really an option yet uh, because we don't have hardware, we don't have beefy hardware, um, which is really what you need in order to um, start producing packages uh, regularly. Um, obviously, as we know, building packages natively is uh, the kind of, that's the least error prone way, right? Um, but since we don't have this, uh, we're kind of, uh, we have the second option, which is to cross compile packages with Poudrier and QMU user emulation. So this has been done before for ARM and, uh, and MIPS and maybe others. So this works a bit. Um, we can, with the older version of the, what is it called, QMU user static package, um, version 3.4, you can build a fair amount of of, you can build a wide range of ports before it runs into any kind of uh, problems. Um, but with the newer versions, um, it fails right away. Um, so I know Warner has done a lot of work to kind of bring that up to speed and, and upstream a lot of uh, our changes there. Um, I think to get past this, it's probably not, there's probably not that many bugs that are hiding in there, but um, I don't really know how to debug it. I haven't gone into that rabbit hole of how to, um, how to save the state of Poudrier and then start debugging the user space emulator. Um, for anyone not familiar with this method, essentially, uh, we use QMU not to emulate an entire system, but to emulate um, the system call up to the system call interface uh, so that you can run RISC V, for example, RISC V programs on an x86 machine. Um, and we kind of trick it with a cross compiler. So 
we go in, we create this uh, RISC-V architecture jail in which we build our packages, but it's done on an x86 machine. Um, so in order to get anywhere new with ports and packages on RISC-V, um, we, we need to uh, make progress with this. Um, a couple of years ago, I think these are the right years, there was kind of an experimental run of RISC-V packages um, where we were using this, this cross-compile method to, uh, to build packages regularly. Um, so that was in FreeBSC 13 era. Um, port manager or whoever was running that did that for a while and then they stopped. Um, so for the... For the past couple of years, we don't have any packages available in the official repos. Um, so if you, you know, boot up uh, FreeBSD RISC V in the emulator, or you run it on real hardware and you say package install, um, it's going to tell you, oh, there's there's nothing. The, there's no bootstrapped version of package that exists. Um, and I don't blame them for for dropping that. Um, it wasn't super coordinated. I know it was an experiment and uh, probably required a lot of babysitting. So this is an area that uh, I think, you know, parallel to being able to run FreeBSD on this kind of, on these kind of newer RISC-V hardware, parallel to that, we want to be able to start um, building and providing uh, ports and packages so that you can do more interesting things on these systems. Um, the, in general, there has been some work to, done to kind of help fix ports that either don't build or are marked broken on um, the RISC-V architecture. Here's a, there's a list that's not really maintained here that kind of has the per per platform uh, list of supported um, programming languages. Um, so on RISC-V, we have uh, C and C++ through LLVM and GCC, of course. We have um, some scripted languages. The, the kind of challenge was with um, compiled languages such as Go and Rust. Um, so these languages, uh, rather than using um, rather than using libc, they um, essentially use the raw system calls um, and provide that themselves. Um, and they were both stuck using uh, an old, a much older version of the FreeBSD system call ABI. So. Um, so I, th I believe Go and definitely Rust were, uh, they were both using the um, FreeBSD 11 version of certain system calls, the pre-64-bit um, inode versions. Um, and the RISC-V architecture, the RISC-V platform is new enough that it never existed for that release, and so we don't provide it. So it has been a bit of a fight, uh, especially for the Rust one of FreeBSD developers telling the Rust or the Go developers, hey, you guys are using, um, you're using the ABI of an unsupported version of FreeBSD. You need to bring this up to date. And so it, I believe it's finally, uh, they finally moved past that on Rust. They finally stopped using um, the FreeBSD 11 and 10 system calls in favor of FreeBSD 12 system calls, which is really great because that's also unsupported, but it at least um, should unblock this for um, the RISC-V architecture. So um, being able to build Rust, uh, provide Rust as, uh, on this platform was, was blocked for a while. Now uh, it's kind of open for someone to investigate uh, as I said, Go had a similar problem that uh, was solved 
uh, last year, I think. Um, so thanks to everyone who worked on that. Java. If you can believe it, nobody asked, has asked me about it. Um, any questions here uh, or, or even thoughts or comments on ports and packages? Um, do you know if I, you crank up a Cheroot jail, if that works with risk v risk thirty or <clears throat> risk v sixty four? Can you can you say the question again? Yeah, if I do a make and install world of a risk thirty or risk v thirty uh, sixty four build and start a jail up with that and try to launch QMU, um, does that work or does that seg fault right away? I didn't. Okay. I didn't quite hear. Um, that was Colin saying that the release engineering is doing it. Great. Right. <clears throat> and the system calls that don't work. Do you have a list of those? No. So I've basically, I've basically it, done it, the 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 Pudriere, like I've used Pudriere from the command line to say, oh, I want to build these packages and set up the um, the newer user emulator, and it, get, it seg faults, and, and I don't know how to look into it further. I'll, I'll look into that. My, I have a student this summer who's upstreaming ARM B, um, <clears throat> I don't know why I want to say ARM B, ARM 64 mm -hmm. support that we have in the Blitz branch yeah. to um, QMU uh, upstream, and was then going to do risk 5 and I don't want to handhold them through the whole summer with things that don't work at all. So I'd like to kind of fix the stuff beforehand while I have some time. Yeah. <laughs> while they catch up to me. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll, I'll try that out. Okay. It's, it's, it's we can chat good. about that too. Cause it's yeah, because it's from what Colin's saying, it kind of works. And then there's something in Pudrier that, that goes off the rails, which is both a blessing and a curse. It means that we may be able to... Get you get get that unstuck too. Yeah, yeah. I think it's not. I think it's probably not something too deep that needs to be fixed. Something probably something small, but um, there's been. Yeah, for me, I haven't had the time or know how to to really approach it. Um, other questions or comments. Great. Um, OK. Platform viability. So I don't have too much left. Um, but in general, I want to kind of open this discussion about you know, what's the current viability of RISC-564 as a FreeBSD platform. Like, where are we? Where are we going? What are the major blockers? So, what works today? Um, we have a maturing base system. We've had two major releases, 13 and 14, with RISC V uh, as tier two. And I would say it's feature complete in the sense that um, I don't think there's anything major that is marked broken on this architecture anymore. So, it, from the point of view of the base system, it looks and behaves um, just like any other architecture that FreeBSD supports. Um, of course, there are kind of there are questions of hardware and, and more esoteric um, kernel features that will need to be implemented. But um, yeah, this is a, this is a milestone I, I would say that that is worth celebrating. Is the state of the base system is uh, in good shape. Cherry BSD, so uh, without speaking for them, who I'm not a part of that project, but uh, Cherry BSD was the original motivation for the RISC V port in the first place. Um, and now we have seen that RISC V has. Uh, has grown enough, um, Cherry is able to use it, and MIPS is gone. So hallelujah. Um, so that, that works. That's a point in, in the platform's favor um, and kind of an indicator of its uh, 
current usage and, and health, uh, shall we say. Um, we benefit from developments to other platforms. So like I said, able to, the porting effort for certain things, um, whether it be, you know, like upcoming Beehive or, um, you know, PMAP improvements or any other kind of major developments that we see on the tier one architectures, um, we're able to kind of benefit from, from those who've come before, um, which is a, another, uh, another point in favor of this platform's viability because it helps reduce uh, the kind of maintenance of it. Um, what else? I, what else can we say about this, uh, about this platform today that is a point in its favor? Is it, does anyone have a thought on that? I guess one point. Um, so, so one point uh, relative to MIPS in particular. There we are. Anyway, uh, so yeah, one one point uh, particularly yeah. relative to MIPS um, is that because the port was basically started by copying the ARM64 tree, it is not a weird outlier. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. You know, if if we had to support arbitrarily weird num you know, arbitrary numbers of weird cash management schemes, that would that would be a point against it. But fortunately, we're eventually, you know, curving towards something that's usable. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, so so, I think it's important for a a tier two architecture to not be weird. Yeah. Um, and like the burden of all the weirdness needs to be on the architecture maintainers. Um, like we're we're like power is failing that at, at that in a number of ways at this point. It was a problem with Spark. Yeah. Um, there were things that were unfixable. MIPS had these problems. Um, so I think Risk Five is nice at the moment in that it is not like a big outlier relative to the others. You know, we have a we have limited hardware support, obviously, and that sort of thing. But at least like the software is not just strange. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great. Uh, a great point, like, and it seems to be the kind of general intent of the both the RISC-V ISA, like the, the instruction set architecture itself, and the um, the kind of platform level specifications. They're saying, okay, we're trying to do things in uh, we're tr we're trying not to do things in weird ways. Um, we're trying to use existing technologies or specifications such as EFI, AC, ACPI. Um, uh, even the platform level specification, which I unfortunately didn't really include in this talk, is kind of based on the ARM platform level specification as far as I know. So yeah, as that seems to be part of the ethos is let's not reinvent the wheel. And from the point of view of the of FreeBSD's support for it, um, we're not trying to do that either, which is a benefit. Um, immediate problems with the platform, lagging support for current hardware. So yeah, out of all that we looked at at the beginning, um, maybe, what was that? seven to nine different uh, system out of chips that we don't support. Um, so we need some kind of foundational um, support for some of these weirder, uh, these, these weirder CPUs that are out there. Um, and that's stuff that I'm working on. Um, but even with that, um, bring up is still not easy. It's still a difficult job. Um, so yeah, our, our 
We could use more hands uh, for hardware bring up. And no ports of packages being built right now. So yeah, we need to fix the, the user emulator. Um, and we need to work with port manager to kind of get that process started if they feel it is um, something that will be worthwhile. Um, but I would say that having no ports or packages and not being able to be build them very easily um, from the point of view of someone kind of evaluating this platform in its immediate state, it's that's a pretty big um, failure. Not a failure, but uh, you know, a point against its health. That was a weird transition. Um, <laughs> they're supposed to be on the same place, same page. <laughs> um, and then we need, we just need new people who are kind of interested in working on this thing. Um, because I've done a lot, and to be honest, I'm not, I'm a fine programmer, but I'm mostly just patient. I, I think we need people who are really good at, at working with hardware who are maybe interested, um, have a new interest in improving r support for RISC-V on FreeBSC. Oh, OK. Oh, OK. That's weird. So OK, yes. Yeah. So the long-term viability of it. Um, here's one thing that I've been thinking about. The, if we compare the kind of what is the market share that RISC-V is going to succeed in, and we compare what is the market share that FreeBSD generally is targeting or succeeding in, um, I think there's not a major overlap. I think RISC-V kind of presents a, it presents a compelling uh, choice when what you're producing is really small embedded chips that, um, you know, maybe where licensing fees would be a problem or um, you just need something really custom. But when we're talking about, um, you know, these little embedded boards that run full-fledged operating systems like FreeBSD, it's hard to see what advantage there is to running RISC-V at all compared to x86 or ARM64, which are years ahead in terms of their maturity. Um, you know, if all we're going to get is kind of the same thing, but with a, you know, freely licensed ISA, like, I just don't, I have my doubts about that ever really catching up and, and taking over. And um, so to me, that is a little bit of a problem when it comes to why are we building this thing. The other kind of aspect that it might uh, be is that, um, you know, RISC V in some way seems to be targeting this kind of world of like micro VMs and essentially part of what they have created with the supervisor binary interface is we want the, the OS kernel to be unable to tell slash it behaves exactly the same whether you're running in a hypervisor or on bare metal, um, which kind of tells me that this is like one of the main areas that they're looking for is, oh, we want, we want RISC-V to be a, like a, a virtualized uh, first um, kind of architecture, which is, I don't know, the way things are going, but um, for me personally, like, it starts to not resemble a computer, and so I don't really understand it. Um, yes. We continue to refine our target platforms, we being FreeBSD. Um, we continue to kind of 
be decisive in removing things. Uh, MIPS and Spark now gone. 32-bit platforms are next. Um, and this is to our benefit because it reduces the, the, the maintenance surface of the kernel and the operating system as a whole. Um, every C CPU architecture that we support um, has a really big cost, even you know, the points in RISC-V favor where it's kind of not special. Um, that reduces that cost, but it's still big. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we ax this thing. I'm just saying that we need to, con we need to evaluate it on a continual basis whether this is, whether the effort that is being poured into it is something that is moving towards uh, something concrete or if it's just holding us back. Um, and yes, as John mentioned this morning, the survey results of kind of what people are interested in, what platforms they're interested in, that's help for, really helpful for making those types of um, decisions. So, you know, maybe what I'm kind of curious about is the people who are interested in Risk Five, like, and who maybe responded so on the survey, like, in what capacity are they interested in it? Do they just want you know, are they just hobbyists who want to kind of mess around with the new latest thing, or do they have a, a different type of view on it? That's all I have in terms of slides. We have, it's been an hour, so now's the time for, I don't know, any kind of discussion about this, or we gain some time back. Um, so anyone have any thoughts or questions at this point? So, I mean, on, on the Cherry project, we're interested in RISC-V um, essentially because it's where all CPU research is being done today outside of corporations. Um, basically, if you want to play, if you want to play, then you must have RISC-V. Um, also, there's a path, there are paths to product there. Um, for, for the Cherry side, um, there's, uh, Codasip has some announced IP, 64-bit application processor sort of IP. Um, that we will be porting FreeBSD to, and hopefully we'll see silicon next year. Um, so that would be that would be very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, if people pick that up right now, if they want to pick it up and run Cherry on it, then they're running FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are, there are plans to do Linux and everything, but it's a big chunk of work. Yeah. Uh, so potentially a huge advantage for us. Um, I think, you know. Yeah, overall, though, like the current ecosystem doesn't match where we play well. I totally agree. Um, you know, the question the question is probably, do the established players, you know, innovators dilemma themselves into the corner mm -hmm. um, and let Risk Five eat their market at the bottom until there's no bottom? Uh, so I think it's useful for us to chase it, you know, while things continue to grow. Yeah, if things. If they stop moving up market, then then it's really then it's time to think hard about yeah. you know, what makes sense. Thank you. That makes sense to me. So what is your sales pitch to get new blood? Hmm. I don't know. I didn't think that was my responsibility. <laughs> well, what drew you to working on this? Um, I mean, I wanted to learn more about operating systems, and that was kind of a, and I wanted to learn more about uh, kernel development, and that was kind of a big area that was not being worked on. So. Um, But, so initially it was the, the kind of drive and desire to, to discover and know more. Um, but having been through that, you know, I can't say that that motivation is still there. Um, 
but you know there it it's a you know the problem of how do we get uh you know new people interested in working on this thing is is the same as how do we get new people interested in working on freebsd in general it's just if th this kind of domain happens to be what they're most interested in. I mean, do you think that um, that we might be able to get more new people to work on this because there's less people working on it, so there might be more opportunity? Yeah, I think so. Well, like, for me, as a, as a student who was, like, still learning, that's what I saw was, like, oh, this isn't, you know, there's not 10 people working on this every day, so in a way I can keep up. I can take my time to learn and and because you know when you're learning it takes you longer to to produce to produce things. So you kind of need to target something that's not um, changing every day. I'm trying to think of the next question. Um, but I mean, so do you think also besides it being an opportunity because there's less people, do you think there's enough people to be mentors for new people in this area? Because I don't know who all, it was you and Reslin. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, I hate to say it, but the answer is no. Um, like. We have a shortage of people who are interested in working on FreeBSD on embedded platforms anyway. Um, like, there's, there's a few, quite a few, like, ARM and ARM64 boards that, you know, have either never quite been completed or have been dropped, like, because, oh, we supported this at one time and now we're not sure if anyone's using it or if, if it still works at all. Um, so I do see that as being a, an area where, you know, I, um, the expertise is like really, there's not enough to go around. This is a similar question to Deb's question. Have you received any funding from the provinces or federal funding for your work? No, no, um, no, I haven't, I haven't investigated that. Interesting, thank you. Uh, regarding the market of the uh, risk five and the I, uh, I want to point out the uh, probably uh, so China will have a uh, large market share of uh, risk five for uh, so so five years late, later or it's ten years in ten years uh, time frame because uh, they are so ARM and Intel never hit their uh, market because of the political uh, conflicts so um, so it um, so I believe that uh, it is worse doing and I appreciate your work about uh, uh, risk five and uh, you know we need to keep up with the uh, 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 things that Linux is, is doing and and the mainland China so the government will adopt the uh, server grade um, and in in the future the server grade risk five chips in their uh, national infrastructure so uh, there will be a big market and uh, if it happens, uh, we want to have a chance mm -hmm. to get into the market. So we need to um, have, uh, at this moment, we need to have the basic support for the risk five at least. And uh, we need to maintain the people like you <laughs> who are uh, taking care of the uh, risk five. So that, that is uh, one of the reasons, in addition to the research, um, uh, to support the least five on the previous D. Yes. <laughs> so 
So uh, also a note from like a cybersecurity perspective. I think that especially nowadays when there is a lot of imp uh, a lot of emphasis on supply supply chain uh, verification, I think that open platforms like Risk Five would be much more uh, uh, attractive, I guess, for vendors. So uh, especially in like international situation. So I think it's definitely there is a future there. Mm -hmm. So definitely keep at it. I guess. <laughs> Going along with that, um, there's also something to be said for um, hardware monocultures. We, I myself kind of don't really like software monocultures, so if we could, uh, the more hardware that's available, the more types of hardware, the better. Um, it increases the, the knowledge required by an attacker to perform a successful exploit. Um, also, are we ever going to see hardware, RISC-V hardware, that, just, that is uh, budget-friendly Mm -hmm. and just boots normal U, uh, EFI, or are we going to still go down this ARM64-like rabbit hole where your choice is either Apple hardware or you got to have a lot of money for something that just boots normal UEFI? Well, if ARM's not there yet, um, I, I don't know how to answer that exactly. Like. It's, uh, that's up to the hardware vendors, and I expect that it's probably more expensive for them to provide something when projects like U-Boot exist. OK. Um, I guess that's it, then, uh, unless there was anything on IRC. Cool. Um, well, I'm very polite. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure.